I apologize for this slight delay. I just want to move some things out of the way here. Thank you so much. That's perfect. All right. Thank you again, Kamande. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all this morning. I'd like to invite you all to kneel with me, and we're going to pray. And as we pray, um, just bear this in mind. Try and let go. I know for myself, sometimes I spend a lot of time with my fists clenched, and every so often I try and remind myself to just open my hands and let go. For some people, that may manifest in a different way. Maybe you're breathing shallowly because you're so stressed and you're so frustrated trying to remain in control. But this morning, I want to encourage us all, whether that's opening your hands, taking a deep breath, just try and let go. Awesome Father God, our Savior, our Creator, and our only source of help and strength, joy, peace, and love, we dare not take a single step forward this morning unless you will go before us unless you will go behind us, and unless you will fill us. We have no need for the words of men. We need a word from you. And this morning, Lord God, we come too full, far too full. And it is only by your strength and your power that you can empty us of ourselves and fill us with you. That the fruit of that reality may be born. Help us, Father God, this morning. We are in desperate need of you. You've heard the prayers and you've heard the songs. Your people are crying out for changed hearts changed lives, and the salvation that only you can give. Let go. So Lord, we are here before you. And we ask that you will have your own way. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, unfortunately, you're getting the short end of the stick this morning because today's message is something that I have had time to listen to God, pray about, struggle with, seek, fast. And now it's coming to you. But you really don't have the short end of the stick because you have the help of our Father God. So I'm warning you to know that this morning's message is of utmost importance. And I encourage you not to resist the process of conviction and transformation. 
Don't fight what God is doing in you this morning. Let him have his way. He loves you so much. And he will not let one of us perish. That is his promise. There is no condemnation. There is only conviction. There is no discouragement, only that we be encouraged in Christ. So this morning's message is titled, In Christ, a what? A new creation. And today we want to understand what it means to be a new creation when we are in Christ. How that happens and why it's important. And today's message, oh, I forgot the click. We're going to be going to the book, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanna see if you can guess where this story is coming from. Are you ready? Is your mind fresh? Okay. Today, we are going to look at the story which summarizes arguably the single greatest opportunity ever afforded to a human being. No human being, oh, let me not be too dramatic, <laughs> but from what we see in scripture, this is a rare opportunity. What opportunity was it? This person received a one-on-one -on -one free consultation with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. During this consultation, this human being, just like us, received a step-by-step -step process that would give them full assurance of entry into the kingdom of heaven. No guessing, no wondering, step-by-step -step outlined, specifically customized to this one individual. Who am I talking about? Nicodemus, who else? Moses, who else? The rich young ruler? I'm hearing many great answers. The one that I'm thinking of this morning, specifically because of how he phrased his question, is indeed the rich young ruler. And what was his question? How much simpler can it get? Face to face with God in the flesh, he can say, what must I do to be saved, to be in your kingdom when you come? That's his question. What must I do? And Jesus gave him an answer. Very simple. Do you remember what it was? He says, if you want to enter life, this is what you must do. Keep the commandments. Straightforward, simple, concise. But then the rich young ruler does something a little bit strange. At this point, he could have said, thank you so much. I appreciate this consultation. I'm going to go and keep the commandments. Do you know where the commandments are? We can find them, we can read them. There's 10 of them and we can keep them. But instead of going forward with gratitude, the rich young ruler asks a strange question. Which ones? If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Perfect. Keep 
commandments. Okay, so now which ones do I have to keep? Now, there are several ways that we can look at this. One way is that maybe he was looking for a bit of validation. That's possible. But the other way is the way that we often look at it, and we literally ask God, which ones? Out of these commandments that you've given us, which ones are actually necessary? It's illustrated by this example. Has anyone done, well, actually, no, I believe by God's grace, we've been blessed to go to school. Now, throughout the process of studying, there are times when we have tests, examinations, from the youngest grade to the highest grade. We all go through tests. Something that was very common when I was studying in post-secondary is that we would receive a large textbook that I believe some of them may even be longer than the Bible, and they would give us this book and say, to pass this course, you must know this book. But then we all ask the reasonable question, but what's important to actually know? If there is a test, students will come together and say, okay, but which topics do we actually have to know? Which ones are they going to ask us about? If someone happened to write the test 30 minutes before us because our section comes after, we go and say, what questions were there? Because now we want to know if we studied the right questions. And we are willing to gamble in studying half, hoping that maybe just that half we studied is all that's going to be on the test. And then maybe by guesstimation, we might get lucky and score a right answer for things we never studied. So this is another way that we ask this question. Keep the commandments. Do we have to do all of them? Which ones? But Jesus gives an honest answer. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Is this true? He covered the commandments that deal with our interpersonal relationship. Interestingly, he didn't even step into our human to God relationship, though it is all human to God, but the specific ones. Nonetheless, he accepts this answer. And what does he say? All these I have kept. What do I still lack? He's been keeping every commandment that Jesus just listed. And I wonder, I pray that one day we have the opportunity to ask this question and say, so during this exchange, did you interrupt Jesus before he finished and just burst out and say, I kept all these. What do I still lack? Or is Jesus taking him through an intentional journey, giving him small doses of information as he can receive them? It's interesting to see how God relates to us. At this point, the Gospel of Mark adds in a detail that's very sweet. Because in this question, you can see a little bit of that self-validation. What more do I lack? At this point, Jesus can say, my son, you are ready. You don't need my consultations. You're doing it all perfectly. You don't need anything further. Just keep doing you, and you will enter life. But when he asks this question, Jesus looks at the man, and he loves him. That's what we hear in Mark. He loves him. 
Ah, oh, my son. Let me tell you. Then Jesus gives the step-by-step process of what he needs to do in order to see the kingdom of heaven. And what does he say? If you want to be perfect, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come and what? Follow me. If you can follow these four simple steps that I'm giving to you free of charge, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Did he get what he asked for? Did he? He wanted to know what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus told him what he must do to inherit eternal life. So at this point, he leaves jumping and rejoicing and praising God and saying, I found the answer. I know exactly what I must do, and I am willing to do whatever it takes because I love the Father, and I want to be in his presence eternally. Now, if you know the story, then you'll realize what I just said is not his reaction. If you don't know the story, you may be wondering, why wasn't that the reaction? Or you're somewhere in between. Because these steps sell all your possessions, give to the poor, then you'll have treasures in heaven and come follow me. We like the last part, come follow me. But the stuff that precedes it, that's a bit challenging. In reality, when the young man heard this, what does it say? He went away sad because he had great wealth. What does Jesus have to say about this? Then Jesus turned to his disciples and he says, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. How did the disciples take this? They're astonished. And now they have a question. So if this is the situation, who then can be saved? If this is what's required for salvation, who can ever do that? Jesus is giving a lot of answers today. And he answers that question as well. And what does he say? He says, with man, this is impossible. And just pause there for a moment. Jesus is saying, it is impossible. It is impossible for a man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he continues. What does he say? But with God, all things are possible. And sometimes we see Jesus work in our lives and through scripture and testimonies with such ease that we attribute his ease to ease in the process and not just his unimaginable strength. But he has spoken clearly and said, with man, with human beings, it is impossible. And the sooner we recognize that we cannot hope to be saved 
unless we fully rely on Jesus, the sooner we will be in a position to actually receive his gift. With man, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. But the man went away sad. Why did the rich young ruler go away sad? Can I hear it? It's not easy to give up the stuff. There's a part in the text that says he went away sad because. But let's consider. What is the text really telling us? Did he go away sad because he had great wealth? When he came to Jesus and asked what he must do to be saved, did he have great wealth? And when he received the answer, did he still have great wealth? He had wealth the whole time. So the wealth wasn't why he went away sad. He was sad because of what will happen to the wealth. And why was he sad because of what would happen to the wealth? Because he loved the wealth. There's a scripture that says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So the issue here is not his wealth. What the text is telling us is that the issue is his heart, which means that when we receive clear instruction from God, if our heart is not in the right place, we will go away sad. We ought to always be seeking the Lord and asking Him to search our hearts. That at whatever cost, we will follow Him. If His heart was focused on the kingdom of heaven in truth and actuality, there would be no sorrow, for He never cared for the worldly wealth. He was grateful for God's gift in the wealth and for what the wealth allowed him to do in service of his God. But if that same God that gave the wealth said, I need you to repurpose it somewhere else, he would say, hallelujah, great is your name. I will do as you have told me with rejoicing. but his heart was in the wrong place. And as we move forward, again, Lord God, touch our hearts and help us to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what really happened is he got sad at this moment when he found out what's going to happen, when he heard the step-by-step -step process that is going to guarantee what? Eternal life, being fully ready and perfect for the kingdom of heaven. Now, in this breakdown, in this one-on-one -on -one consultation that Jesus offered free of charge, he prescribed a standard. What did I say? a standard, and he also prescribed a means by which to reach the standard. Now, what is the standard that Jesus is setting? I love the way you said that, to be like him, to be just of the same heart as our Father. The scripture says to walk just the way that he walked, to love in the way that he loved. So the standard that is set here 
is simply these two words, be perfect. That is his standard, complete, fully devoted. Don't get distracted <laughs> by the words, be perfect. Focus on the what? The standard. The standard is perfect. Why? Let's find out. Is that really what he's saying? Because that's a tall standard to reach, is it not? And I told you, I was struggling because when I read this, I can't imagine how anyone could ever reach a standard like that. And then I realized Jesus said it. It's impossible. With man, it is impossible to reach that standard. But then he gave us hope. But with God, all things are possible. So now we need to understand, is he really saying, be perfect? Has he said this before? Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. What does it say? Be perfect. Be perfect. Therefore, so this is the standard. This verse actually goes further. Don't just be perfect in your earthly and carnal understanding of the word. That's not what I ask of you. I want you to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, is that an upgrade or a downgrade? <laughs> so I was discouraged when I see be perfect. And now, as your heavenly Father is perfect, you're setting the standard even higher? Is this really what you're saying? So we read the texts that come before. Matthew 5, verse 21 to 22. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged. This is not condemnation. This is conviction. This is transformation. This is seeking the Lord. Matthew 5, verse 21 to 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago. Here's the commandment. You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. The rich young ruler said, I have done this. I have never murdered. Since I was a boy, not one person have I murdered. But then Jesus takes it a step further. But I tell you, at my standard, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to what? Again, so that you can hear it clearly. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka. Now that is in the context of the text. That is something that's harmful, a rude word to say to someone. Is answerable to court. And anyone who says what? You fool. Speaking harshly to brothers and sisters, rather than speaking words of life and encouragement, shaming them, breaking them down, hurting one another, you will be in danger of the fire of hell. We focus on taking someone's life, literally. Jesus says, if it's not in you to murder, it will not even be in you to curse your brother and sister. The moment you begin to curse your brother and sister, to be angry with one another, you have just positioned yourself in a position that gives the enemy all he needs to moment by moment draw murder out of you. You are either in God's standard or you are in the earthly standard. 
whether you are murdering or you are cursing your brothers and sisters, being angry, refusing to forgive, talking terribly about people, spreading lies and gossip, you are still positioning yourself in destruction. But is this really what he's saying? Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That's your standard. But my standard is that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Just the look, the fact that you could look twice, knowing that you are a married man, knowing that you are a child of God, to be so taken with the form and beauty of earthly creatures that you take your eyes off the Savior and start looking at creation. You have already done it in your heart. This is so serious that I'm telling you, this is what Jesus says. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. He says it another way. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to go into hell. Do we need to be so extreme to cut out our eyes and cut off our hands? Or can we simply learn to do what the scripture says? It says, my eyes are always before me. Don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Don't browse, don't peruse. Keep your eyes fixed on your God. And what he says, look at, look there. And when he says, look somewhere else, look there. You can stop looking. You can stop doing. And if you can't stop doing, Whatever it is that's causing you to stumble, throw it away. Whatever possession you have, it's better to enter life. It is better to go through life without a phone than to allow your phone to consistently cause you to stumble. It is better to miss a few calls and a few emails if that will take you out of a position that you are not yet strong enough to stand the devil's temptation. If you cannot walk uprightly in a certain environment, step out of that environment. If your friend group consistently encourages you to sin, forsake those friends. It's better to have no friends and enter life than to have all the friends and encouragement and be lost. Cut it off. What's he saying? 43, verse 45, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute. Pray for those who are persecuting you. Because you'll learn to realize they are not persecuting you. It is the sin in them that has won the victory. And you need to pray over them because it breaks your heart that this brother and sister that is persecuting you could be lost out of blindness to their persecution. Pray for them that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
he causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? I have a different standard, he's saying. If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? It doesn't take an overflow of the love of God to hold the door for someone. And I'm not, I am not shaming that. We are to do these things. Human decency and courtesy, loving lifestyle, spirit-led lifestyle is so important. But we ought to stop setting our bar at human decency thinking that we are now so different because we are decent human beings. The pagans are decent human beings, some of them. The tax collectors were decent human beings to those they loved. An overflow of the Spirit moves to a new standard, the standard of God. And we serve a perfect and a holy God. We see it throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is not the first one to say it. He's saying what his father said. Be holy as I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. And if you are representing me, if you are, are, if, if you are receiving my gift of calling you my children, you have to be like me. The standard has been set. So when he says to be perfect and he sets the standard far out of reach, he still wants us to reach that standard. God will not lower the standard to come and meet us. What he will do is clothe himself in humanity, lower his physical appearance, step into our reality and speak face to face and give us instruction to come and be with him. But he's not going to lower the standard he is stronger than that. And with God, all things are possible. So now we move to his step-by-step -step process. What are the steps? Go sell your possessions, let's read it together, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come can we break this down? Because this is a one-on-one. -on -one. This is a customized consultation for the rich young ruler. It's not going to look the exact same for everyone, but we can pull the principles out of Scripture. What are they? Number one, go. That is the first step in seeking the kingdom of heaven. Go. Make an immediate effort. Or rather, as it's written there, make an effort immediately. It's separated to emphasize immediately. Because we may say, I'm going to make an immediate effort next week. I'm going to make an immediate effort tonight at devotion. You need to make that effort as you sit in these pews. The moment you hear, you take action in the strength that God gives. So go. God is not going to do everything for us. The beautiful thing about our God is that he gives us free choice. He could force us all to love him, couldn't he? But he loves us too much 
to even force us to love him. It's a strange foreign reality that God loves us so much that even if we want to destroy ourselves, he loves us too much to force us. He wants us to choose. Make an effort. Decide in your heart and go. The second, sell. What is the scripture telling us? We need to detach. The possessions that the rich young ruler had were bound to his heart. They affected his every word, his every thought, his every decision. And Jesus knew that while bound to these possessions, he could keep the Ten Commandments at the level of the carnal. But in order to keep the commandments at the standard that God desires, he's going to need to detach. Because you can't keep asking yourself, if I obey God, what's going to happen to? But if I follow his command, what will become of? We have to be detached. I don't know if anyone has ever been in a situation where you're shopping, maybe you've got a lot of groceries in the cart, and there's just one thing that you forgot to grab. When you're at the checkout, do you say, oh, let me just take all these things back and go get that one item across the store? The best thing for you to do is to detach and go and get what's needed. But for us, we hear the clear words of God. And before we take action, we start gathering, trying to see what we can do. And then when we see the door he wants us to go through, we're looking to God and saying, but God, is this the door? Because I can't fit with all of this. There must be another door. Keep the commandments, but which ones? There's not room for all of my tendencies. We have to detach. Give. What are we learning here? I mean, plainly, even that on its own, give. Let us be people who give. Our God is a giving God. We ought to be a giving people. But even in addition to the giving, what we're learning is dependence and reorientation. When the rich young ruler had the option to give, that would have put him in a very unique position because you can liquidate your assets, can you not? And still walk away full. Sell everything you have. You know, I was feeling like business was getting a bit slow. You know, I was thinking of kind of liquidating, you know, and starting something new. But liquidate and give away? That is a restart. That means that he no longer has his own means to care for himself. He now has to depend on the means of the Father to care for him. The one who feeds the birds will now have to feed him. And is God able? He is able. So if God tells us to give, and to depend, then we ought to depend. And something happens in the dependence. It says, you will have treasure in heaven. What's that teaching us? We have to reorient where we are storing our treasures. We keep storing our treasures in the ground, in the earth, trying to make things right on earth while the heavenly matters are fading. We need to reorient. As we go 
day to day is the thought in our mind constantly, what can I do for God? How can I be of service? What can I do that represents what God has done in me? How can I store up treasures in the kingdom? Or are we constantly thinking about what's going to be coming up in a few months and we need to set a little something aside in the bank? These are responsible things for us to do. But it must never come out of balance. And oftentimes, our financial struggles are not because we aren't making enough money. It's because we're spending too much. We're trying to hold on to things that we don't have the means to maintain. Sometimes, if we just downgrade, you could walk much more comfortably. Freedom. Reorient. Place your treasures in heaven. Depend on God. And the last one, follow. Fully submit and let God do his work. And I think we will realize that in order to do this one, we must follow the steps that precede. Now, we will be doing it the whole time, but to follow full-heartedly, we are going to have to make an effort. We are going to have to do it right away. We're going to have to detach. We're going to need to depend. And we are going to have to reorient our minds to focus on the kingdom. And as we follow, something very interesting happens. We will find ourselves constantly cycling through the previous steps. As we follow God wholeheartedly, he'll keep telling us, I need you to do something for me. And immediately we'll have to go do it. He'll keep saying, okay, I'm walking you step by step. We're not there yet, but I'm so grateful you're following me. That just warms my heart. I'm going to need you to detach from this. I'm going to need you to depend more on me. And then you'll keep walking and say, okay, here's another one. I know this one means a lot to you, but I'm going to need you to detach from this. And we're going to have to do it. And we're going to keep walking. And we'll start to feel a little bit lighter. But we may keep looking back. And if we look back, we will be hurting ourselves. So we need to look forward. And God may point something else out. I need you to depend more. I appreciate that you detached, but you are too stressed about the loss. <laughs> you detached yourself from that, but I've been here the whole time. There is no loss. You didn't lose anything. You have only gained. Depend on me. Keep your eyes on me, he says. Just keep looking at me and just keep walking. Keep walking. And we'll cycle through this process. And this process is such a beautiful thing. And it can be represented in one word. Sanctification. The beautiful journey in which God restores our hearts. Are you ready? Where he restores our hearts, fills us with things that are of him, helps us to truly love the way that he loves, live the way that he wants us to through sanctification. And we're going to illustrate that now because we wonder, what does that really look like? being sanctified. Now, if you're sitting directly here, I'm not sure if you can see it, but this is an interesting moment because while you all were sitting, you probably thought things looked pretty clean. But how amazing. Thank you so much, Kamanda. I appreciate it. Now that this has been shifted, it reveals a lot of stuff 
that's back here. Do we really need all of this? Who knew that this was back here? When you looked on the outside, it looked like it was just a table with a nice skirt. But now that it's been moved, you can see there's a lot of hidden, I don't even know if we could call them treasures. And that's what happens when God looks at us versus when we look at ourselves. Because we will look and say it's clean, it is good. But God knows what's behind the curtain. He knows even better than we know. And as we go through this process of sanctification, we will even find ourselves being amazed and saying, Lord, I didn't know that was back there. Where did that come from? Now, what God desires of us is to live righteous and holy lives, just as he did, correct? And I think if we were to get a visual, we might say, it looks a lot like this vessel, pure, spotless, clean, untouched, fully devoted to God. Amen? Does anyone want to be like this vessel? Can anyone be like this vessel? No. Why not? Why did I say no? Because there's a condition. We can only be like this vessel in Christ. We may want to be like this vessel, and we may try very hard, but unless we are in Christ, something always seems to get in the way. What is this? Sin, the carnal nature, the flesh. No matter how hard we try to remain like this, bit by bit, now we have been stained. We are no longer worthy. And this happens very early in life because we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And it all started with just one. That's all it took. Just one stain took Adam and Eve out of the garden. Now, if we are to try and achieve and gain salvation by works, what does that look like? Well, it looks a lot like this. We are busy and stressed, trying to get rid of all our sins. It's a slow process, but because we have willpower, we might be able to do it. But as we're working diligently, the carnal nature just keeps sprinkling more in. And it lets us come to church. Please go raise a hallelujah. Give thanks. Give tithe, but no offering. And the carnal nature just keeps on sprinkling it in. I wonder, do you think this vessel will ever, ever be clean? Why not? Because with man, it's impossible. Before you take one out, your sinful nature will pour another one right back in. 
You will be frustrated. You will be angry. You will be serving in ministry, upset and exhausted. This is way too hard. Trying to achieve salvation by our works. But thank God, a better way was provided. As we reorient and we detach and we seek God, we see another vessel that could have been pure. But then some things happen that the vessel is not proud of, but it tries to keep it hidden out of fear of judgment. And as those things fester inside, they create more and more evil, anger, and resentment. And now the person is too afraid, this vessel is too afraid to even come to church because it is just too sinful. This vessel is full of the flesh, sin. Is this vessel ready for the kingdom? Is it ready to see Jesus? This vessel saw the efforts of its fellow vessel. And maybe in its carnal mind, it thought they were making pretty good strides. I, th I think I better start working. And they all come right back. What hope is there for this vessel? Come to Jesus just as you are. Overflowing with sin. You are worse than an unbeliever. Have you ever truly considered yourself as one who claims to follow God, having seen his commandments? Maybe some are even born in this church. And after knowing everything that's required for life, you find yourself worse than an unbeliever. There's no hope left for me. It's too late. Brothers and sisters, it is never, ever too late. Are these two vessels in the same position right now? Are they both sinful? Are they both doomed for destruction? It's heartbreaking to say, but yes. There is only one who can change that. The Holy Spirit and the grace of God comes into the equation and says, my grace is sufficient for you. Come to me just as you are. And for a moment, you think nothing's happening. I told you, I'm just too sinful. Why did I even bother coming? Just wait, just keep walking. There's no hope for me. Why are you wasting your time on me? Just stay with me. Just stay with me. I can't do it, Lord, I'm too weak. I know, that's why I'm here. Just stay with me. And all of a sudden, something starts happening. And they take a step back. What was that? Something just fell off of me. I never had victory in that area of my life before. I've been trying for years and all of a sudden this, I mean, I'm not there yet, but there's just a glimmer of hope. There's just a little part that I, that you've won the victory in me. How could you do that for me? Will you let me do more? Father, please have your way in me. And as Jesus pours in 
the more you let in, the more he will fill you. And the sin just starts falling off. How hard is this for the vessel? Is the vessel cleansing itself? Has the vessel done any work for its salvation? Has it lifted a finger? All it's done is surrendered. It said, here I am, Lord. Fill me. And then the sinful nature starts to see what's going on. What is this? I put these things inside of you. Why are you getting rid of them? We need to get that back down there. The carnal nature starts trying, trying to push it down, but every time it tries to get another sin, it just keeps coming back up. I'll get that later. And then the Spirit says, that's enough. I have not finished my work. This is still my child. Should we stop there? Why not? The vessel is cleansed. Look, look at the difference. Should we stop? But this vessel is ready for glory. It keeps the commandments. But there's still something there. Something very interesting happens. Very interesting happens. Because this vessel, does it feel cleansed? This vessel can only see its sin. And it still feels unworthy of the grace of God. How could you do this for a sinner like me? This vessel is self-righteous. Look at me, I'm cleansed. Anyone who looks can see I am cleansed. But what is deep inside is still sin. The cleansing of God works from within, within the heart and pushes the sin out that you will never be able to boast in your righteousness because your sin is always before. You still don't feel worthy and you haven't done anything. It is just God. You all said we should give some more of the Spirit. Fill me till I want no more. Fill me up, Lord. You see, I told you, I'm full. What more can be done? I can't be saved. I have done too much wrong, and no matter how much you fill me, I will never be able to stop sinning. I'm human. This is plain. There's something that we call overflow. Have you ever heard of overflow? As we seek God and we seek the Spirit, do we want overflow? Should we allow this vessel to experience the overflowing of Christ's goodness in their life? The overflowing of the Spirit in their life? Should we allow them to walk with their God? What will happen? I told you, I'm human. I cannot stop sinning. No matter what I do, there will always be one thing I cannot surrender. And Jesus looks at the vessel and smiles. (laughs) My dear vessel, I love you. I created you. 
you have done nothing up to this point. If you fail to be cleansed, it is not a reflection of you. It's me. Are you saying I can't cleanse you? But look, that one sin just will not leave. What more can you do? <laughs> My sweet, sweet vessel. Eyes have not seen, Amen. nor ears heard. What can happen if you just believe? If you just change your perspective and realize that I have the power, there is power in the blood. There is power in the Spirit. Nothing can hold you. Is this vessel ready for glory? No. And this is the sobering moment. The deeply sobering moment that we realize we can never make it. Patrick, there's a little button there with some music. If you could just click that for me. There is still opportunity to be self-righteous here. To think, look at me. I'm cleansed. I'm sinless. The Lord has won the victory in me. I never stumble. I walk blamelessly before the Lord. When I walk up to heaven's gates, it's going to be like an automatic door. It's just going to open because my holiness will command that the door opens. But then you reach heaven's gates and you stand before a holy God and he looks at you and you say, my father, as you can see, I'm blameless, I'm holy, I am victorious. And God comes and he says, this hurts so badly. I did everything, everything possible, everything needed for you to be saved. never knew you. But Lord, I cast out demons in your name. Lord, I perform miracles for you. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I'm looking at you, my child. And all I can see are the many sins that you have committed. And I'm so grateful that you finally agreed with me that my way is right. But you've committed sin and the wages of sin is death and I will not change that because my standard is set. You tried. I tried, but someone has to pay for these wages. It's not about you being perfect. That pagan, that vessel right there, if they really channeled their willpower, you think they couldn't be like you? If they locked themselves away in a tower, and refuse to open their eyes, starve themselves of food, and refuse to commit sin? You think they couldn't look like you? It's not about looking like this. You look like this because I'm in you. You can't do anything to be saved. 
And I tried to tell you that. But when you are saved, you will look like this. But you, my beloved vessel, you just wouldn't accept my son. And he is the only one that can justify you, that can step in and say, my father, my father, don't look at what they did. Don't look at who they were. Father, things happened to them that should not have happened and they struggled and struggled to make themselves right and things got even worse. My father, please don't hold this sin against them. But the sin is still here. Someone must atone for the sin. Someone who is worthy must atone for the sin. Otherwise, this sinful vessel will never enter life. Jesus says, Father, I've done it. I've done it. I have taken the cost of their sin. I have, I've washed them, Father. Look, there is nothing. And they fully submit to me. They've cleared their lives of everything that is not like me. They focus their minds. I dwell within them, even as I dwell within you. Father, they're changed. They are a new creation. And what they could not do in atoning for the sins they have committed, I've done it, I've washed them. And because they accept my washing, and they submit to the process of my sanctification, Father, they're perfect. Welcome them in. What does this vessel have to say? Lord, no, it's not true. Father, I've, I've, never, I've never done a good thing in my life. I'm wretched. I'm weary. I'm worn. I'm unworthy. Don't look at me. Please stop looking at me. I'm not worthy to be in your courts. I'm not worthy to have your love. Your forgiveness, I am not worthy, Lord. <laughs> it's okay, my vessel. Jesus has done it all. And this morning, we have the opportunity to receive the same gift. in truth, in actuality, to have victory, not because of our works, but because of faith. To be with our Father in heaven, not because we earned it, but because he paid the price. Possible, because we can't do this, we cannot cleanse ourselves from sin, and even if we could do that, we cannot atone for the sins we've committed, so there needs to be justification and sanctification, which can only be done through Jesus. And this morning, if you are willing to receive God's gift, of eternal life through the process of his sanctification and justification, I invite you to come forward. If you believe, if you believe this is possible, if you believe in the name of Jesus, and are willing to be filled and to forsake all things that are behind. Come forward.
if you are willing to declare, Father, I'm sorry, come forward. If you are willing to come just as you are, come forward, thank you. If you recognize that there is nothing that you can do to be saved, come forward. If you believe that all things are possible and you are willing to submit to the cleansing work of the Spirit, then let us submit ourselves to God and let Him do the work that only He can do. Let us pray. Father God, we submit ourselves before You, not because we are worthy, but because You are loving. Not because we are able, but because You are able. We bring nothing of value we come, Lord God, wanting to be empty vessels, but we're so full of our sin. And no matter how hard we try, we keep finding ourselves doing the things that we are trying to be victorious over, the things that you have instructed us to forsake. We can't do this without you, Lord. So we come with faith, not our works, not our self-righteousness. We cannot atone for what we've done. Even if we stop sinning and following our sinful ways from this moment, Lord, we still cannot atone from what we have done. And we are totally reliant on you. Your children, Lord, are standing before you. Every child, Lord God, here in this room, online, across the world, Lord, we are surrendering our sin to you. And God, this process will not be easy, but you will do it. For us, Lord, this is impossible, but with you all things are possible. And we believe, Lord, so cleanse us. Give us new perspective, Lord God. Help us to see you for who you are, by the power of your name, by the sacrifice, and by the glory, Lord God, that you have risen with. Make us new. Let us in you be new creations. Give us victory, Lord God, and let joy fill our hearts that we no longer have to be a slave to sin. We no longer have to suffer through the pain and the shame and the regret of being powerless to conquer the sin that so easily entangles, but that we can rest in the work that you have done here in our hearts and on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that not only have you died and paid the price, but that you have risen to make us new. And we cannot wait to see your face, to dwell with you in glory. God, help us to follow the steps that you have given us that we may live with you, that every step we take will be with you. Every thought will be brought captive, Lord God, and surrendered to your spirit. Every word, every deed surrendered to you. Cleanse us, Lord God, search us, try us, and if there's any wicked way in us, Lord, reveal it to us that we may have victory over it by your blood that on that great day you may stand and say, these are they who have come out of great tribulation, 
who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, those who have been victorious, not because they were strong enough, but because they made a choice to believe and to receive. In the all-precious, all-powerful name of Jesus, amen. I encourage you all take just one or two minutes. Just go to your seats and just have two minutes of reflection and stillness. Let God speak to you. Whatever he's putting on your hearts, he is, he is wrestling with your hearts right now. He is bringing conviction. He is doing his transformation. Give him just two minutes. Just two minutes. As the music can continue playing, just softly. Just two minutes. Father God, as we leave this moment, we pray that you will continue to speak to your people. Let this moment not be lost, but continue the work that you are doing for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. As our response to the message that God has given us today, shall we sing 322, Nothing Between? Shall we all stand as we sing the song? Sure. 
submit our hearts and our minds to you totally and completely. God, you've shown us much today, and none of it can be done by our own will or strength. It must be done through you and by you. Lord, help us to give you the time and the space to do this work. Help us, Lord, to take action immediately, to detach ourselves from the things that hold us captive, to start choosing to spend time with you rather than time in other things that are perishing. Help us, Lord God, to give you the time and space in our lives that we may learn true dependence on you, that we may learn to reorient ourselves and store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. God, we surrender all and we desire to follow you. We believe and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 